All right, notice with me as we come to Hebrews chapter 6. We spent last week, Sunday morning and Sunday night, in verses 1 uh, down through uh, about verse 8. And last Sunday morning, we preached a, a message titled, uh, Believers and the Doctrine of Christ in verses 1, 2, and 3. Last Sunday night, we were in verses um, 4 through 8, and we titled that, Unbelievers and the Doctrine of Christ, Dealing with the Apostate. Well, this morning, I'm on a title of the message. The title is going to be taken from verse 9, but we're going to consider verses 9 through 12. And the title is, Things That Accompany Salvation. You see that, we're going to read it in just a moment, but you see that expression given to us in verse 9. Things that accompany salvation. And tonight we're going to come back and from verse 13 through verse 20, we're going to look at the subject of heirs of promise, and that title is taken from verse 17. Now notice as we read from verses 9 through 12, I do not have any kind of an outline this morning or tonight. I'm just uh, going to come back to this passage. I want to, after doing half of this chapter last week, I felt like that we need to finish it up. Now notice in verse 9, he said, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, the, though thus we speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Heavenly Father, we do pray this morning and we thank you first of all for another week and another privilege and opportunity to assemble together. Lord, we pray this morning for thy blessings and thy anointing to be upon the reading of thy Holy Scripture. And Father, we pray that through this text and by the Holy Spirit that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, help me to convey the things that I believe that you've laid upon my heart this week. Lord, help us to understand this, but not only understand it, but Lord, help us to do it. Help us to believe it and be obedient to it, for we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen, and you may be seated. Now again, we're going to title this out of verse 9, Things That Accompany Salvation. Uh, <clears throat> this chapter can be outlined in many different ways, but especially four ways. In verses 1 through 3, he's teaching us to go on unto perfection. In other words, spiritual maturity. In verses 4 through 8, he's given warning against the, uh, against apostasy. In other words, those who will fall away after they say they believe. And then in verses 9 through 12, our text this morning, encouragement to the believers. And then in verses 13 through 20, the certainty of God's promises. Now, in verse 9, he says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. In other words, this expression, things that accompany salvation, uh, that is, the things that belong to salvation, uh, the things that follow salvation, conversion, he has just finished, in verses 4 through 8, he has just finished perhaps one of the most severe warnings in, in the whole book and in the whole New Testament. Notice in verses 4, he said, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. That is one of the most severe warnings in all of the New Testament. And now he begins verse 9 with the word, but, he said, but beloved, 
we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. We find here that we are going in one direction or the other. There's no one neutral. We're either headed toward heaven or headed toward hell. We're either growing in grace, growing in faith, or either we're showing unbelief. We're going in one direction or the other. Many today are playing games with God. They say that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they absolutely do the opposite of what He said in His Word. We find that our eternal destiny depends upon the text that we're reading here last week and also this morning. Verse, verses 4 through 6 that I, that I just read. And by the way, he concludes uh, the apostate with verse 8. He said, But that which bringeth uh, thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. That's the end of those who make a profession and then fall away and turn away and reject everything that they said they had believed. That is their end. So we found out last Sunday night in verse 4 through 8 that there is a spiritual condition when saving repentance becomes impossible. And that has to do with apostasy. So we are to take heed of unbelief, carelessness, and neglect when it comes to the Word of God in our faith. But verses 9 through 12, on a more positive note, we find here that there is a spiritual condition when saving repentance is possible and the evidence is seen. In other words, there will be things that will accompany uh salvation. Now let's read verse 9 again. <clears throat> and again, I don't really have an outline. I'm just going to camp out here. We're going to look at some other verses if we have the time. But notice notice that he begins with this conjunction here. He says in verse uh, 9, he says, but beloved. In other words, he's been talking about the apostate, uh, verses 4 through 8. And now he, we have a transition from the warning to encouragement. And we have here, he's as speaking to the apostate, and now he comes back to the believer. He was talking about the believer in verses 1, 2, and 3, using words like us and we. And then he began talking about the apostate in verse 4, down through 8, and he refers to them or those. But notice what he says in verse 9. He said, but beloved, we. He's coming back to the believer, the true believer. He said, he said in verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. In other words, uh, we as the apostles and you as the congregation. He said, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work of, uh, your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So we find that the Apostle Paul here, we believe Paul wrote this, there's debates about that, but the, I'll just say the Apostle, in verses 1 through 2 and 3, is speaking of the believer and the doctrine. And now he comes back to verse 9 after speaking of the apostates. And notice he refers to them as beloved. There is a change of audience from verses 4 through 8 and beginning in verse 9. There's a change of audience. It's we and you. In other words, those who have been born again. The letter is written to believers. But notice he refers to them as beloved. Uh, that's, a, that's a very special name. It shows a special love. It shows that we're the object of God's love. It, it expresses the highest kind of relationship, beloved. And, and I believe this is the only time that this is used in the book of Hebrews. Um, we know that the Apostle Paul referred to the Romans in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7 as beloved saints of God. Jesus Christ was called the beloved Son in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7 and also in Matthew 17, 5. 
And then the Bible said in Ephesians 6, uh, not Ephesians 6, but in Ephesians 1, 6, says He has made us accepted in the Beloved. So think about the tender words after giving some harsh warning to the apostate. Notice the tender words that are brought about here by the apostle. And he acknowledged the fact that they belong to God. And he acknowledged the fact that they have worked and labored and have ministered in the name of the Lord. Notice he said in verse 9 again, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Paul was totally convinced. Let me say the apostle. Somebody will challenge me on that. I do believe Paul wrote this letter. But the apostle here, he is totally convinced that they know the Lord. They're saved. And he's saying that they are not only saved, but there's evidence of salvation. In other words, there's things that accompany salvation. I want you to notice with me in chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. Later we're going to come back and read some other verses in chapter 10. But notice verse chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. And notice what he said. Speaking of the just who shall live by faith. He said here in verse 38, he said, Now the just shall live by faith. Notice, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The apostate of chapter 6. But notice what he said in verse 39. He said, but we, speaking of himself and the believer, he said, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So in chapter 6, verse 9, when he says here, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. He's not only saying that, that he believes that they're saved, but he says, I see the evidence of your salvation. And he's going to list some of these things. We have a description and a list of some of the things that come along with salvation. He says, I'm persuaded. Verse 9, but beloved, I, we are persuaded better things of you. In other words, that word persuaded means to be convinced. He was convinced of their salvation and the evidence of their salvation. And he begins to talk about it here in this passage. And he ends this chapter with their hope that they have in heaven. Now notice when he says better things, he says better things of you. He said, I am persuaded, in verse 9 again, of better things of you. In other words, this is in contrast to those who were falling away, those who were committing apostasy. These better things are the things that's going to come along with salvation. And the better things, better than just appearances. You know, as we read in verses uh, 4 through 6 and camped out there last week, we saw that there were some people that were once enlightened, And they had tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They were convicted by the Holy Ghost. And they had tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And he says that if they fall away, it's impossible to renew that person again. In other words, they had the appearance. They had been exposed and affected by the word of God, but they did not have a true possession of the Holy Ghost dwelling in them. So, he's saying to the saints he's writing to, he said, this is better than just having the appearance or being exposed to the Word of God. He says, I see your good works. That's what he's talking about in this passage. Verse 9 again. He said, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. You ever thought about that? What are the things that accompany salvation? There's some of them listed here. We can go to other places in the New Testament and find other things. We're going to look at Thessalonians in a few moments. So he says there are things that accompany salvation, and it's not just appearance, it's real. And so when we talk about things that accompany salvation, we're talking about things that come along with salvation. Have you ever really thought that through? They can't be separated from salvation. 
People tell us all the time that they know the Lord, but where are the things that accompany that? Now, we're talking about things that accompany, not things that accomplish. What we're going to be reading about here is their work and their labor and their love and their ministering to the saints. These are not the things that accomplish salvation. We know it's the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood alone that accomplishes salvation. But these are things that accompany salvation. These are the evidence and proof that someone has truly been born again. Verse 9, and things that accompany salvation. They're never separated from it. They give evidence of the state of salvation. They're attached to it. Let me put it that way. He's talking about things that follow salvation. Things that belong to salvation. Things that pertain to salvation. Things that are joined unto salvation. We witness to a lot of people, Oh, I know the Lord. Everybody down south here thinks they're saved anyway. You know, and said, oh, I know the Lord, and they have no fruit, no evidence whatsoever, have no desire to be in the house of God, have no desire to pray and to read her Bible or to witness to others, and there's many things, but the apostle lists some of the things here that come along with salvation. He lists the fruit here, the evidence of truly being saved. The proof of genuine conversion is here in this text. In other words, it's not just a mere profession, but it is a possession of this salvation that God gives to us. Now again, we've seen the warning last Sunday night. We've seen the doctrine of Christ last Sunday morning. So let's step into this now and consider this. Let's read verse 9 again and then come to verse 10. He said in verse 9, he said, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Now notice as we come to verse 10, he's gonna, he's gonna list some of the things that these saints were doing. And there's other places in the Bible, again, basically he's talking about fruit. In other words, uh, notice in verse 7, before we read there, in verse 7, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs, Meat for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessings from God. Talking about fruitfulness, the true believer. And then in verse 8, he's talking about the apostate, the unfruitful. Now notice some of the things that accompany salvation in verse 10. Again, you can just put in your mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list several things as we look at other verses, but just put in your mind, basically he's talking about good works or fruit as we just read in verse 7. And notice now, he said in verse 10, he said, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward His name. Notice this is shown toward His name. Saints, everything that the saints do is for Christ Himself. And he said, he goes on to say, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Now think about it. First of all, he said that God is not unrighteous to forget your work. Work. James chapter 2. We'll turn and read that in just a moment if we have the time. In James chapter 2, especially in verse 17 and verse 20, a living faith is a working faith. We're going to read a passage in a few moments in Ephesians 2. We know that we're not saved by works. But there, but works accompany salvation. They follow. That is the fruit. And we see that in many places. And so, to give you an example of that, I will read in one passage. I want you to listen to this. In James 1, I'll read there. In James chapter 1 and verse 21, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now listen as I read from verse 22 through about verse 25. He said, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If someone hears the word and doesn't do the word, they have deceived themselves already. By the way, that's not the devil deceiving you. That's not the world deceiving you. That's not somebody else deceiving you. That's you deceiving yourselves. 
If we hear the word and are not a doer of the word, we deceive ourselves. He said in verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, in other words, Luke said himself, and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Be like a man looking in a mirror, knowing he needs to comb his hair and wash his face, and he said, hmm, I'm just going to go on. Well, people look into the Word of God and they see where God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be holy. I want you to love me and so forth. And they just go on about their business. Then he said in verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Word of God. It's called the royal law in chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, and listen to this, And continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. In other words, he'll be happy and have peace in his heart because he is a doer of the Word of God. Now, verse 10 again, in our text in chapter 6 of Hebrews, he said, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work. I'm going to come back to that subject in just a moment. And then he goes on to say, and your labor of love, labor of love. We find that love is in the list of nine different things of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and in verse 22. Untiring service here in this passage, motivated by the love of God and the love for others. And then notice the next thing that he mentions. And he said, which have shown toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. In other words, they not only have done this in the past, but he's saying here that they're still doing it. They have ministered in the past. They're still ministering. We're going to come back toward the end of the message to verse 11 and 12. And he's going to encourage them to keep doing it. So our text is showing that they have ministered, they have been faithful, they are serious about the things of God, they are ministering at this present time, and then he's going to encourage them to continue to do that the rest of their life. Turn with me to chapter 10. Keep your marker here in in chapter 6. Notice with me in chapter 10, and let's look at just a few things that they were doing. We come here and uh, chapter 10, I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. In verse 23, when he says ministering to the saints, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but it's a love for the brethren. The Lord Jesus said in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he said, that's the one way that the world will know that you belong to me. In other words, the, the, the loving one another love for the brethren. Also, you can write down Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. And we find that when the Lord, speaking of the second coming, separates the sheep from the goats, and He says unto them to enter into the kingdom, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world, And he says, I was a hundred and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. And I was in prison and you came unto me. Of course, he said the righteous, in other words, those who are saved as we're reading in Hebrews, they said, when, I'm going to put it in my own words, when did we do any of these things? And in verse 40, he said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these of my brethren, you have done it unto me. The evidence, the proof, or I could say the things, as the Bible says, the things that accompany salvation. The things that come along with it and the things that follow it. Can't detach these things. These things don't save us. They don't accomplish salvation, but they accompany salvation. Now, notice in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through about verse 25 or 26. He said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, notice the next few verses. And let us, there's there's about three let us here. 
He begins in verse 22, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. In verse 24, he said, let us consider one another. Well, how can I consider or how can we consider one another? There's many ways. But here's one way. He said, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The word provoke here is used in a good way. Most time people use it in a bad way. And we provoke people to do the wrong thing. But he said, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the things that accompany salvation. We're talking about the good works. The labor which we do, ministering to one another. Well, what is the case here? He said in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now listen, as the manner of some is. I can say that today. There are those today who have forsaken the assembling of themselves together. Not just in the first century. The apostle dealt with this in the first century, but we deal with this in our time as well. He said in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Look at this, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And again, we have another severe warning in verse 25 down to about verse 31. Severe warning for the apostate. For those who fall away, for those who will forsake the thing that they once had made a profession of, there's severe warning here. He said in verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now, Avery, you quoted this verse to me this morning. I don't remember the context now. Verse 31, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But I want to begin reading in verse 32. I want you to notice in verse 32, Keep in mind... They, they were assembling together. He said there, he said there are those who have already forsaken it. And I want you to notice also that they did minister to others, not only minister to others, but they ministered to others while they were going through a great fight of afflictions. Now watch carefully as we begin reading from verse 32 through 34. Now he's writing to the believers. He said, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Partly while you were made a gazing stock. None of us want to be made a gazing stock. That's to be belittled and made fun of, put on display and laughed at. None of us like that, do we? But he said, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches, notice, and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. So these believers, and and then this is why the apostle is encouraging them. They're staying with the stuff. And they're staying true. And so he's encouraging them in chapter 6. He's saying, and we're going to see that as we go back later and read verse 11 and 12 and then finish the chapter up tonight. But he's encouraging him. He said, look here what you've been through. You have endured a great fight of affliction. You become a gazing stock, both by reproaches and affliction. And, and he says, and you were used. Just like those in the Old Testament and other times were used and abused. But notice what he says in verse 34. He says, For you have compassion uh, of me and my bonds. So the writer is in prison. And he said, You have compassion of me and my bonds after you... Let me, I, I'm, I'm skipping down too far. Let me come back to verse 34. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Think about this. And by the way, you don't see any rights taking place. You don't see anybody protesting or threatening someone else. These are going through reproaches. They become a gazing stock. They're in a spiritual fight of afflictions. And they, and, and they had their properties and things taken away from them. And he says, you done the right thing. 
And he's praising them for that. And then he's encouraging them from verse 35 through the end of the chapter to be patient, as we're going to see in chapter 6, to be patient and and to maintain your confidence, that is your faith in the Lord, for the Lord will settle all scores when he comes again. Now, now notice with me as we turn back to chapter 6. In chapter 6, and I like the passage too in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15. There's, it says there's a family there, the house of Stephanus, that it says that they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The apostle Paul put that in the Word of God and uh, God had it put in there, had him to write it in there for us today and a whole family that they addicted themselves to what? The ministry of the saints. That's evidence of true biblical salvation. Now let's read verse 10 again. We're going to turn away for a while, then come back toward the end. But he said in verse 10, For God... Let me let me read verse 9 and 10 together. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you ministered You have ministered to the saints and do minister. So this is encouragement, and he's going to continue on through the rest of the chapter to do so. And this is encouragement to those who truly believe and have the evidence of salvation. Well, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, and notice with me in chapter 1. We have very similar words here in this passage. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1, I want to begin in verse 3. In verse 2, the apostle thanks God for this church at Thessalonica. Notice what he said, almost the same as what we read in Hebrews 6. Of course, I haven't finished reading verse 11 and 12 and connecting it in Hebrews 6. But notice what he said, there's three things, three things that the apostle praises the church at Thessalonica for. In verse 3, he said, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Notice that. Secondly, your labor of love. And number three, your patience of hope. We find all three of these things in Hebrews chapter 6. And he goes on to say, In our, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, verse 4, Knowing brethren, beloved, notice they're also referred to as beloved, beloved of God, He said, your election of God, verse 4, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and much assurance, and you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples. I've been told and I've read that that word in samples is an even stronger word than example. And uh, it's like a, it's a stronger meaning, like a hard hit uh, to leave a mark on a coin, stamping out coins. But he said in verse 7, So that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you... Sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your, uh, your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had unto you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait. Notice the patience there. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, what do we have here? We have in verse 3, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. Those three things, we see all three of these things in Hebrews chapter 6, which are a description of the things that accompany Salvation. In other words, stay with it, stay faithful, be dedicated to the Word of God and the Church of God and the things of God. So let's look at these individually. The first thing back in verse 3 is the work of faith. I want you to think about this as an evidence of faith 
In other words, the evidence, let me put it this way, the evidence of faith is works. We see that all through the Scripture. In other words, works which result from faith. We don't turn them around and get one before the other. A working faith, a faith that is alive and a faith that is active. Contrary to what we see in Scripture as a dead faith. Notice in verse 8, their testimony reached 200 mile radius. That's a working faith. Their work of faith. Notice in verse 9, they turned to God from idols. They gave up their idols. You say, well, America doesn't have idols. We have more idols than Africa or some of the other nations have. The Bible in Ezekiel 14 speaks of the idols of the heart. He said you need to get rid of those. We're filled with idols many times. It's not just bowing down before something. We bow down before a lot of things in our heart. And then, as we read this, he said that they received the Word of God in verse 5 in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance in verse 6, and they became followers of the apostles, having received the Word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And they became examples or examples to people 200 miles away. So I would call that a work of faith, wouldn't you? And that's what faith Does Notice in chapter 2, reading in verse 13 and 14. In chapter 2, reading in verse 13 and 14. I want you to see here that it was an effectual working in the Thessalonians. Notice in verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as... But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you, that believe for ye, brethren, became followers, notice as followers and sufferings, of the churches of God, which which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So this church was born out of sufferings and persecution just like the church at Jerusalem. And he's saying, you have been treated like the apostles and others were treated in Jerusalem. They were persecuted. And he says he's praising them for this. I want you to turn with me to James, in in the book of James in chapter 2, and think about all the book of Hebrews especially Hebrews 11, the chapter on faith, faith moved people to action. We find that in Hebrews 11, 7, that Noah built an ark. What was that? Is a work of faith. We find they are called a great cloud of witnesses in chapter 12 and verse 1. In Hebrews 11, we find that Abel, why did he give the right sacrifice? Because it was a work of faith. True, genuine faith. Why did Abraham leave his country and travel hundreds and hundreds of miles on foot and camel? Why did he do that? Because of this faith. Why did uh, Enoch walk with God? Why did Moses bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? All of this is because of genuine conversion and genuine faith. It's called the work of of faith. Notice in James chapter 2. In the book of James in chapter 2, and I'm just going to read a few verses here. Uh, let us begin in verse 17. We can actually back up and begin in chapter 1. Uh, he begins talking about works in verse 14, but let's, let's read from verse 17. He says, so even so faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone. What we're going to be reading about is that faith does work. Saving faith is accompanied with good works. Saving faith versus dead faith. 
Why is it in our community, in our state, in our country, that we can talk to people until we turn blue in the face, and they'll look and tell you they're going to heaven, they know Jesus, and there's no evidence, they have no desire for the things of God. You know why? Because they have a dead faith. Those who are truly born again have a saving, living faith. In other words, we find that this letter gives a clear description of what true faith really is, showing that what faith is and what faith is not. So this is why he said in verse 17, I'm going to balance this out with Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 in a moment. But he said in verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. In other words, this is not a faith this is not a this is not a faith that uh, produces works. Verse eighteen: Yea, a man may say, "Thou hast faith, and I have works." Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Verse nineteen: Thou believest that there is one God; thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Didn't Judas Iscariot believe that there was only one God? Did he not know the fundamentals of the faith? And that Jesus was the Son of God. He knew all of that. But he was lost. He was an apostate. He didn't have saving faith. But go on, verse 20 said, And what wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now you say, well, what about Romans 4? Well, you should have been grown past that by now. Romans 4 is talking about when Abraham initially believed on the Lord. And here we're talking about the perfecting of faith. He said, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? That was many years after he had believed. When you read from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and Genesis 20, there's a number of years that go by. And he said in verse 22, Seeing thou how faith wrought with his, with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. In other words, it was brought to maturity. It was the evidence. Remember what God told Abraham after, after Abraham walking with the Lord? He made some mistakes along the way. But in chapter 22, he had walked with the Lord. Uh, long enough that he knew he could trust him with everything. And when he said, take your son and sacrifice your son, he just got up and went to do it. And the Lord says, I know now that you love me. I know now that you have obeyed me. Verse 23, And the Scriptures was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed in him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. There are things that accompany, not accomplish, not accomplish. There are things that accompany salvation and it is good works. It's to bring forth fruit unto God. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Notice with me in Ephesians chapter 3. Chapter 2, I'm sorry. Chapter 2. And just for time's sake, let me read verse 8, 9, and 10. Notice verse 8, 9, and 10. Verse 8 and 9, first of all. All of us can quote it, right? And we use it in witnessing, right? And we should, among other verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Lord knows that if we could save ourselves, we'd be in heaven bragging about it throughout eternity. So we're not saved by our good works. But I want you to notice what verse 10 says, starting off with the word for. He said, for we are His workmanship. Notice this. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are not saved by our works, but we are saved unto works. And you can't separate this because good works accompany salvation. It follows along because of living genuine faith. Not a dead faith, but a saving faith that an individual has. In other words, they're not an apostate. In the article we wrote titled Good Works, Titus 3.8 says, This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. At least 30 times in the New Testament, the Bible is encouraging people to perform good works based upon their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. We find that the work of faith or the fruit of the Spirit is contrasted with the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, verse 16 through 21. But here's a quote from another author, and he says, By obedience to the commands of God, we evidence the sincerity of our holy profession. By this our faith is declared genuine before men. Whosoever pretends to believe in Jesus and is not habitually careful to perform good works, his faith is worthless, barren, dead. By good conversation in which our lights shine before men, we edify our brethren, silence opposers, and preserve the gospel from those reproaches which would otherwise be cast upon it as if it were licentious doctrine. Colossians 1.10 says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasings, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's a good balance here. And those who are truly born again, they will be things that will accompany salvation. Now, he talked of in Thessalonians and Hebrews 6, about not only the work of faith, but the labor of love. Well, write down 1 John 3 and verse 14 through 19. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Peter 2. But write down 1 John 3, verses 14 through 19. Clearly, this lays out the fact that if we have passed from death into life, that we will love the brethren. Clearly, our labor of love, labor is motivated by love and by the sacrificial love of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Our service is for Christ and because of Christ and the fact that He is working through us. In Philippians 4 and verse 3, women who labored in the gospel... Why did they labor? It's called the labor of love. It may even be difficult at times, but the labor is able to be done because it is motivated by love. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, I believe it's verse 14, that the love of Christ constraineth us. That means that it urges us and kind of pushes us along. You don't have to have somebody beat you over the head with the Bible. God will do this. God will take His Spirit and He'll just kind of urge you along. Uh, you lay out a church, He'll let you know it. Nobody has to knock on your door if you're truly born again. If you don't read your Bible, the Spirit of God will let you know that. Now notice as we come to 1 Peter, and I'm reading in chapter 2. The third thing, by the way, that's mentioned in Thessalonians and also in Hebrews 6 is the patience of hope. The patience of hope. That's the endurance, the steadfastness, the perseverance in tribulation. That's exactly what the Hebrew saints were going through in the first century. We are strangers and pilgrims and foreigners in this world, according to Hebrews 11. And still yet, seems like so many want to embrace it and be a part of it. We're strangers, pilgrims and foreigners. John 10 and verse 10, the Lord said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. 
Well, notice as we come here in 1 Peter chapter 2, I want to point out just three or four things that will be evident in the Christian's life. And one is a hunger for the Word of God. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envyings and all evil speakings, now notice this, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. One thing, I'm I'm going to just give you four things here. One thing is, is that genuine conversion, the things that accompany salvation, the things that are attached to salvation, the things that come along with it, that pertain to it, is a hunger for the Word of God. You let a little baby be born. The first thing a newborn baby wants is milk of its mother. And it never gets enough. And if you don't give it to it, it will cry. And if you continue not to give it to it, it will scream and yell to the top of its lungs. This is why the Lord Jesus said in John 8 and verse 47, said, you're, you're not of me because you don't believe my word. He speaks of those who believe. Job made, in the book of Job in chapter 23 and verse 12, said, esteem his word more than his necessary food. So one of the signs, one of the evidences of truly being born again is just a hunger for the Word of God. It doesn't mean that you have to read it ten hours a day or anything like that. It's just that you want to, you want to read God's Word, you want to hear God's Word preached, and, and it's just a hunger for the Word of God. I gave you my testimony that when I got saved at 19, the, the first thing I did is pray, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And the second thing that I did is that I went and got me a Bible. I bought me a Bible. And then I started going somewhere where somebody could teach me that Bible. So it's very important that we understand this. Those who are truly born again, they will have a hunger for the Word of God as a baby has a hunger, a newborn baby, for the milk of his mother. The second thing is right here in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, and that is a desire for holiness. Notice as we come, I'm going to begin reading in chapter 1 and verse 13, a desire for holiness. You ever thought about this? God saves us to make us holy and to sanctify us. He doesn't just save us from hell, does He? He saves us to make us holy and to sanctify us. We find that the Bible said in Hebrews 12, 14, that no man shall see God without holiness. Romans 7 We read about the Apostle Paul. You know what he did? Even after he'd been saved many years in preaching, many years, he mourned, uh, he mourned his sins over his sins. He said, Oh, wretched man that, that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And of course, he goes on to show us how that, that will take place. We find in Romans chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, clearly, what we were like before we were saved and what we're like after we become saved. We were, we were free from righteousness before we got saved. We didn't want it. After we get saved, we're free from sin. We see clearly that those who truly born again have a desire for holiness, Christ's likeness. We're predestinated, Romans 8.29, to be conformed to the image of His Son. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. We find in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 that he talks about the Spirit of God will bring us from one degree to the next, from one level to the next. In other words, as we behold the Lord Jesus Christ in His glory. Paul said he labored in Galatians, I believe it's 419, that the Galatian churches, there were about five of those churches, that they, that Christ would be formed in them. So there's that desire there. We're told in Ephesians 4, put off the old man and put on the new man. The Christian wants to do that. You don't have to beat them and beg them and whatever. They want to do that. 
Now notice as we read from verse 13. He says here in verse 18, he said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice he says, as obedient children. You ought to underline that. As obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Have you ever thought about this? What what was it that put Christ on the cross? It was sins. And He saves us that we might be holy. Much more than just saving us from hell. And, and so we need to abhor sin as Christ did and as Paul did and as others. Sin is what put Him on the cross. Do we really abhor sin? Are we grieved over our sin? When we sin, do we ever think about, this is what put my Savior to death? So, I believe that one of the signs of being saved is that we have a desire for holiness. Not only a desire for the Word of God, but a desire for holiness. The next thing I want you to notice in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, notice here. I'm just going to read just a few words from this passage. This is where Saul of Tarsus was blinded by the Lord. He met the Lord on the road to Damascus and he was saved. First thing he said in verse 6, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And he's blinded for so many days and the Lord sent a disciple, Ananias, to him in verse 10. And he said, when you find him, in verse 11, tell, tells the, the Ananias where he's going to be. He said, when you find him, here's what he said in the latter part of that verse. He said, behold, he prayeth. I want you to think about that. Behold, he prayeth. The true believer not only has a love for the God, God's Word, a desire for holiness, but also has a love for prayer. First thing you find Saul of Tarsus doing is praying. He's praying. And we find that uh, we've, we've spoke on this a lot, especially in the last year or so, but prayer speaks of communion and fellowship and dependence upon God. The less we pray, the less fellowship we have, the less communion we have with God, and the less we show others that we're depending upon God. In other words, we're going to work things out ourselves. In Genesis 4 and verse 26, we find there's a statement there after the deal with Cain and all of his stupidity and his sin and rebellion. It says, And men began to call upon the name of the Lord. In other words, a renewed interest in the things of God. A renewed interest. Turn with me to John chapter 15, and then we're going to go back to Hebrews 6 and close. Notice in John chapter 15, I'm going to read one verse, but this chapter begins with Christ being the true vine, and you and I being the branches. And I want you to notice as we read in verse 16, I'm just going to read one verse. Another true sign of salvation is fruitfulness. Notice what he said to his own disciples here in this passage. And by the way, so many passages we've already read. Some we sang one this morning. In Psalms chapter 1, where the tree is planted by the river, its branches are fruitful and so forth. In other words, it brings forth fruit. Colossians 1.10, I just read that a moment ago. Galatians 5, verse 22 and verse 23. Nine things associated with the fruit of the Spirit, starting with love. Love, joy, and peace. And the list goes on. But notice here, we find that in verse 16, and keep in mind, Christ is a true vine, we're the branches. The only way to bear fruit is that we must be in Christ. We abide in Christ. 
And he said in verse 16, And ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you. Why? That you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. In other words, he said, I've ordained you, I've chosen you, I've called you. Why? That you might bring forth fruit. The Lord wants us all to bring forth fruit in our lives. Turn back with me to the book of Hebrews and notice with me in chapter 6. I want to bring this to a close. Hebrews chapter 6. You see, when John the Baptist came preaching, we read this last week. John was preaching the baptism of repentance. And he said to those that came out, he said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, worthy of repentance. And also, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10, he said those that have no fruit, he said, cut it down as a tree and cast it into the fire. And then in Matthew 23, or I'm sorry, Matthew 13, 23, there's four types of ground in the parable of the sower. And one of those is called fruitful ground. In other words, the seed went into that ground. It's, it, it represents the heart. Fruitful ground represents the heart. And it gives you four kinds of people. And one of them, when the seed is planted, the seed being the Word of God, that it will produce and it will grow. Just like what we read earlier in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 7. Well, notice now, I want to come back and I want to begin reading in verse 9. I'm going to close in verse 12 and make a few comments here. Notice the importance of this. He said in verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. And things that accompany salvation, the, though we thus speak. In other words, he's saying, there's some things that accompany salvation that the apostates don't have. They appear to have it, but they do not. He said in verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his saints, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So we find they had ministered in the past. They are ministering as the author writes this letter. And another thing here, he says that God will reward you. God will not forget your work of labor and your ministering to the saints. He said he'll never forget that. In other words, he's going to reward us for that. Now notice in verse 11 and 12, he's going to encourage them to move forward. Now just keep in mind the great persecution in the first century. The church at Jerusalem was scattered because of persecution. The church at Thessalonica was persecuted. The church at Smyrna was persecuted. Many were being persecuted. As you read through 1 Peter, five chapters, and every chapter, Peter deals with the persecution that the people were going through. So the apostle of Hebrews, he's wanting to make sure that they do not get discouraged. He wants them to keep looking forward and keep moving toward the goal. Now watch as we bring this to a close. And I want you to see too, as we read this, that God obligates Himself to His people. And it is He that is working in us anyway. See, that's why that good works accompany salvation. Because He's the one that working in us. We have nothing to brag about at all, no matter what we think we've done. So He has obligated Himself to His people that He will work in us and that He will not abandon us. He's promised that. And that He will see us to the end and then on top of all of that, He will reward us. Would you stand as we read these last two verses? Verse 11 and 12. If this won't bless you, I can't help you. <laughs> 
I can't do anything else for you. But uh, this has been a blessing to me to go through this this week, and then we're going to look at the heirs of the promise tonight. But notice now, verse 11 and 12, and he said this. He said, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope unto the end. Verse 12, that you be not slothful. Now, he did talk about the dull of hearing in chapter 5, verse 11. But he said that you be not slothful. Now, watch this. But followers of them who through faith and patience, notice, inherit the promise. In chapter 11, we've seen all of the saints that went before us. Chapter 12, they're called a great cloud of witnesses. And so he's encouraging these saints as well as you and I today is that we will show the same diligence and that we will have full assurance of the hope unto the end. And he said, And that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you have so freely given us through Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that you're working in us. And the things that accompany salvation is what you have done in the life of every believer. Father, we thank you for, again, this time together. We just ask your blessings now upon the hymns as we sing them. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.